Hey Bulldogs, Chris Bryant, the Computer Certification Bulldog here, and in today's CCNP Route Video Boot Camp, we're going to take a look at OSPF stub areas, and we're going to go way beyond the theory of the stub area and actually see it in action on live Cisco routers. For you CCNA candidates, I'd like you to watch this one as well, because I know you learn a couple of things about stub areas, but maybe you don't really see them in action during your training, and I do think that the theory of it will stick with you a lot better when you actually see what's going on with a stub area. We'll see how it affects adjacencies and also how it affects our routing table. This is also a little bit of a preview, if you will, of a longer free course I'm going to put out on Udemy.com for you CCNP route candidates very shortly. So watch out for that. I'll have the URL in the blog, the newsletter, Twitter, and anywhere else I can think of to get it out there. But I know you'll enjoy it. Let's go ahead and bring the study guide up for the NP route. And what we've got here, we've got a RIP domain running between routers 1 and 5. And everything else here is OSPF. So I'm going to, or in this case, already have performed route redistribution on router 1. We'll go ahead and review that config in just a moment. And in that live free course, excuse me, the free course I mentioned a moment ago, we'll actually do the redistribution during the video. But we've got OSPF here between routers 1, 2, and 3 in area 0. And each router has its loopback in a separate area. We also have an area 34 down here between routers 3 and 4. So let's go ahead and bring the live equipment up and we'll check out router 1 first. And as you can see, here's the route redistribution I did on OSPF, excuse me, the RIP routes going into OSPF and the connected routes as well. Now for this redistribution, I did not need to give a seed metric. But what I did need to do for OSPF is indicate that I did indeed want subnets redistributed. Now for RIP, I had to specify a seed metric because RIP does not even begin to understand anything over 16, right? I mean, 16 is unreachable, and you know that OSPF metrics go over that pretty quickly. So we've got to give RIP a metric that it understands, and that's exactly what I did there. And that's really about it, pretty straightforward config. So what we're most interested in in this video is router 4. And let's go down and take a look at router 4's routing table. Now let's hop over to 4. And I'll run show IP route OSPF. Now help me out here, a little video practice exam for you. What does this IA indicate? And on top of that, what does this E2 indicate? We don't have any just plain old OSPF routes here. We've got some IAs and some E2s. Let's take a look at show IP route, and that'll tell us exactly what's going on there with our code table. And E2, that's an OSPF external type 2. That's a route that was learned via redistribution. And we know that that is the default code for such a route. So that's why we're seeing those E2s. Now these IAs, these are routes or networks rather, that are in other OSPF areas. So we know that router 1's loopback was in area 1 and so forth. And the larger network we see here, 172.12.123.0, that's the frame network. And that's in another area too. So we're seeing exactly what we expect to see. But what one value beyond the administrative distance, what one value do we see here that all of these routes have in common? it kind of yells to us, you know, hey, we can knock this table down a little bit. And that value, of course, is that next top IP address. And we didn't even have to look at this table to see that, because when you're looking at this particular network, if router 4 is sending data anywhere, it's got to go to router 3. It doesn't matter if it's a RIP domain, if it's a, if it's a RIP network, if it's an external network, I should say, or an internal network, it's still got to go to router 3. Now let's go ahead and check our connectivity here before we go any further. And you can see that I'm pinging the external routes. Everything looks good there. And I believe we had a 7 as well. Yep. So we've got connectivity. And let's go ahead and bring the table back up. Now there is nothing wrong with this table. But and if you've taken courses from me before, especially your CCNA, you know what I'm about to say. We really want to keep our routing tables complete yet concise. 
The smaller the routing table, the better we like it. It just makes for a more efficient routing process overall. Now, of course, we still have to keep that connectivity, which we will definitely test at the end of this video. But one way that we could knock this table down a bit is by making Area 34 a stub area. Now, especially for UNP route candidates, what effect on this routing table, excuse me, what effect will making Area 34 a stub area have on this routing table? What's it going to do? And another question for you, I know you know the command, <coughs> excuse me, I know you know the command for making Area 34 stub, but does that have to go on router 3 or router 4 or both of them? Well, let's take a look. Let's do an IP OSPF neighbor. And there's our neighbor, no big deal there. And to make area 34 stub, by no small coincidence, that's exactly what I'm going to type. We've got some other options here, some of which you're familiar with if you're working on your NP. And you've got area 34. We're just going to go with stub right there. And that's it. And immediately, we lose that adjacency because we reset it, neighbor down adjacency force to reset. The problem with the adjacency right now, though, is that it's not going to come back because you've got one router, router 4, that has the stub flag bit set in its hello pack and says, okay, this is a stub area. But router 3 is disagreeing. So we're going to lose our adjacency that way. What we'll do is go over to router 3, of course, and make that a stub configure it as stub, I should say. Router OSPF1, area 34 stub, and you can see the message we just received on this side. The dead timer expired. So, let's hit area 34 stub and see if we get our adjacency back. We can actually see some of that with debug IP OSPF ADJ. So let's make sure, of course, it comes back. Whenever you see this, it usually is a good thing. You see two-way communication, there's a DRBDR election, there's the router ID for that other router. We move forward and that is about it. So I'll do a U all to turn that undebug all command on, which turns our debugging off. And let's just verify. Okay, so everything's exactly what we how we expect to see it. Now, what are we going to see over here on router four? when I run show IP route OSPF. Which routes are going to be there and which ones aren't? Well, you see the inter area routes are still there. But look at this. All of those E2 routes, they're gone. And they've been replaced by a single default route. You can always tell by that asterisk. And we can always tell by that as well. And the next hop is 34.3 still. So that's fantastic if it works, right? Because we've knocked our routing table down by 50% by making this into a stub area. But of course, if we don't have that connectivity, then that's not doing us much good. So let's try those pings again. And they're looking pretty darn good. So that's fantastic. So that is exactly what a stub area can do for us. It took all of the external routes and replaced them all with one default route with the same next hop IP address. So we knocked our table down by 50%. And you're probably thinking too, well, can't we do something here with these IA routes since they've all got a, the same next hop IP address? We can, and we're going to look at that in the next video when we talk about another kind of stub area that'll help us out with that, and that's a total stub. So thanks for watching this particular video. I'll see you at udemy.com with that longer free version of the same video. And I'll see you very shortly with the second part of this video. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Bryant, the Computer Certification Bulldog.